I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing that was all started by a mouse. Well, hello, everyone out there in podcast land, also in Facebook land. We are the Beyond the Mouse podcast, the podcast about all things Disney for the Front Row Network. And boy, do we have a special episode for you today. Uh, we are so excited to sit down and talk to director of not only a Goofy movie and 102 Dalmatians, but also Tarzan and Enchanted. Uh, we are going to sit down with director Kevin Lima. And I'm just a little behind the podcast. We just did. And oh my goodness, this man is so incredible. So can't wait for you to be able to hear that. But I'm Craig, I'm uh, gonna be your host for today. Also, my other hosts are joining us as well. Mr. Brett Rutherford, how are Hello. you, sir? Oh my gosh, really great and excited and nervous and everything. I'm full of emotion. <laughs> Absolutely. And Vanessa? Hi, I'm <laughs> Vanessa. I've just had the most incredible experience because Phil Collins, well, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and Amy just, Adams and everything. Oh my gosh! It, stay tuned. You're gonna love it. So many great stories. Uh, he was so generous and gave us an hour of his time. And uh, I really, truly, I will say it's it, it's just a wonderful interview. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. In case you're listening back to this, and uh, thank you. We can't thank you enough for coming on board uh, with us, but I think we're just going to go ahead and let you get right into it because it's just a fun thing. We talk everything from a goofy movie to his career in animation to what he's up to today. So without further ado, here's our interview with Kevin Lima. Hi, sir. <laughs> wow, look, there's a big group. Yes, yeah. yes. So, yeah. So, um, my name's Craig, and we did the interview a couple of years ago. And then yeah. I also have Brett and Vanessa here. Brett well. and Vanessa. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Well, everyone, we're so excited today to have a special guest on with us. And I have to give just a little bit of a backstory to this. So, back in 2017, uh, Brandon Davis and I were able to cover the Lincoln Film Festival. And at that time, we were able to interview Kevin Lima and his wife, Brenda Chapman, about their films. And they were uh, showing some screenings, and they even did a screening of a goofy movie. So, I've got to see it on the big screen. Uh, and they also did some Q&As, and they were so gracious with their time. And I will tell you, at the end of that interview, I think I was the one that asked, I said, you know, Kevin, uh, the 25th anniversary of a Goofy movie is coming up pretty soon, and we'd love to have you on again. And he said, sure, I'd do that. And this is just proof that he is a man of his word, because we are so excited to have the director of not only a Goofy movie, but also Tarzan, 102 Dalmatians, Enchanted, um, and worked on so many films that kind of defined the Disney renaissance, whether that be as a, a writer or as a character designer, an animator. And we're so excited to have Kevin Lima join us today. So uh, thanks for coming on, Kevin. Oh, it's, it's good to be here. Thanks for asking. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to start off with a couple questions uh, about a Goofy movie because it is celebrating its 25th anniversary. But we also want to talk a bit about your career and, and sort of the chronological, uh, how you got to where you are and what you're up to today as well. So I'll start off first. It's been 25 years since the release of a Goofy movie. What's your reaction to the life that the film has taken on after its release? Well, as you might guess, I'm thrilled. Um, the movie didn't make do a lot of business when it first came out, to be quite honest with you. When it was first released in theaters, it did, I think, it's about $37 million, which is nothing compared to The Lion King, which made like $420 million domestically. So at that moment, I thought, okay, this was a stepping stone. This was an opportunity to become a director. And I have to say, over the years, it has become the most talked about of all of the movies that I've directed. It's kind of remarkable. In the last couple of years, I'd say in the last three or four years, I've really noticed the, the resurgence. It's been huge. We did, a, we did a screening at the El Capitan in Los Angeles and sold out crowd it was like watching the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And at that moment, I realized, oh, people are really committed to this thing. They really love this movie in a deep way that I, had, that I really had no idea of. So, uh, so it's thrilling to me. 
to, to, to see this to see this happen. It's a movie that means so much to so many of us that grew up in the 90s and looking at it as uh, not only a great road trip movie, but, but Goofy is such a, a great father figure in this. And I know, Brett, you had a question about Goofy in particular. Yeah, well, um, so Goofy had been in Disney films since 1932. And you did your research. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, these are things I just know. Yeah. Well, so, I can tell by the books yeah, behind you that they probably are things you know. Oh, yeah. It's kind of, it, this is kind of my virtual studio here right now. So anyway, yeah. thanks to Zoom. I have a virtual studio. But um, you were true in, in a Goofy movie. You were true to everything we love about Goofy. But how are you, how are you also make, uh, able to make him a relatable dad in a contemporary story? Well, you know, from the outset, I always thought of Goofy as being related to his time, right? Whenever he was in a different oh. piece, he was a different character, so to speak. And in the 50s, he was a, you know, he was a stay-at-home dad. Um, so I thought, since he's evolved throughout history, it sort of gave us permission to take that next step with him, which was creating a level of emotional depth. So... So it was really about looking at the history, seeing where that character had been, how to be true to who he had been throughout time, and then taking the next step. And Successfully. that's where we went with it. <laughs> so, awesome. Is it different, um, talk to me about the development of Goofy in a Goofy movie versus the development of someone like Max, who may not be as quite a, a fleshed out character. So you, you almost have more um, leeway with a character like that. Is that, is that accurate? Or, or which one did you, did you enjoy uh, kind of molding more, adding your uh, ethos into Goofy or adding um, sort of reintroducing Max to, to us all? I think I probably relate more, especially at that time in 1995, I wasn't a father at that point. So I was looking for something from the movie that I knew would be different than what anybody would ever see. My, let me give you a little bit of history. My dad left when I was 12 and I didn't see him again for 25 years. So a goofy movie in some ways became me working out my issues of you know, what is it like to have a dad? What would the ultimate expression of that be? How do I, how do I present something that would have felt real in a sense? So for me, I think I leaned more towards Max as far as the character that I related to more. And as far as sort of giving him, I, I wanted to let him grow up from the series, right? So that's why the, that's why the Goofy movie takes place in high school. Goof Troop is a much earlier sort of uh, age. Um, I think he's in middle school, I think, um, if I remember correctly. So it allowed us to, to, to grow the character up and explore some things that maybe they weren't able to explore in the television show. So between that and me being a great admirer of um, John Hughes movies and thinking, why hasn't anybody made an animated movie that feels like a contemporary John Hughes movie? Well, this became the opportunity to do that, to speak to contemporary, well, 1995 contemporary kids and, you know, what they were going through and sort of the universal idea that, uh, you know, we all have to break away from our parents at some point and gain a deeper understanding of who they are as people. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so interesting, too, because uh, we, we went out to Facebook and kind of asked uh, any of our listeners that wanted to also ask a question, and Al wrote in, and he said, um, you know, how do you get a character that is so, I mean, goofy, is just, just in the name, uh, that is, is his character, um, and he kind of referenced also, like, the end of Hot Diggity Dog uh, in the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse uh, TV show. How do you get that character to then do those scenes, like, in the hot tub, uh, in the car? with Max where it's like really it's emotionally powerful stuff that you're adding on to this right. character that is just over the top goofy so um, did you have any hesitation with uh, bringing more adult themes like that or, or more of a, an emotional resonance uh, to this character or was it something that you always wanted to do within the film um I worried about it. I fretted about it a bit because I thought here I am messing with an iconic classic character 
Um, but I also thought the only way to tell a long, a long, you know, long form story with him would, would be to add something, would it be to give something to the audience that they don't usually, you know, that they get to, they get to just discover something about a character who they thought they knew, but they find out they didn't really know completely. Mm -hmm. This guy actually has sort of, he has real feelings and he's not just a, you know, a dip. He's uh, not just a goof. He's actually, uh, you know, a fully formed three-dimensional person. So once we started to explore that and you could see how, how it was adding something new to the character, I had no reservations at that point. In fact, though, you know, I have, I have, very, I have close friends who, who don't like what I did to Goofy. They are unhappy that I, that I messed with Goofy. Um, so, but, but I think that what's being proved out is that it, that it worked. I mean, it really, it really said something to an audience, right? So a whole audience, a whole generation of kids relate to this, this idea. And in fact, it's a universal idea, right? Is, you know, moving on and thinking your dad's, uh, you thinking your parents are just idiots and finding a new, uh, finding a new relationship, you know, discovering a new relationship with them. It's the mm -hmm. universal eye rolling that everyone <laughs> goes through. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. yeah. What's interesting about you brought you brought up this thing earlier about Max is that I used to make videotapes because we were making this movie during a time when there was no internet, right? So I had to make VHS tapes of myself acting out the scenes for the animators so that they'd have some direction because so I couldn't be there with them um, for part of the part of production. So it ended up that Max, all the animation of Max started coming back looking like me, it was <laughs> acting like me. And it was kind of <laughs> weird. I was like, this is bizarre, but I guess that's what I'm asking for. So they're doing a good job. It works. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. That's perfect. Um, so we'll definitely return to Goofy uh, in a little bit, but we also wanted to talk to you a bit about your career. Uh, and Vanessa has a question about kind of your college days and, and sort of how you started in all, all of this. Oh my. Yeah, well, I'm glad you said that um, you were acting out the, um, the, 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 the characters because that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. I was watching a Goofy movie and I'm, I'm like, gosh, this is just like a really cool musical. It kind of reminds me of Grease almost. And right. then I was listening to one of your interviews and you said that you almost went into theater so I was like well oh, yeah. there it there it is <laughs> so <laughs> so um why could you uh we all met in theater so could you tell us a little bit about you know why you didn't go into theater and how that influences your work well th this might be a little bit of a long story but I'll, I'll try to keep it uh short from the time I was five I wanted to be an animator I went and saw the jungle book with my mom and the names went up at the end and I put, and she said, those are the people who made the movie. I said, who are they? And she said, those are the people who made the movie. And I said, I'm going to make that when I grow up at five. Okay. Wow. So I was pretty determined. I think it's a, it's a classic sort of animator story to be really involved with drawing and animation at a really young age. Um, I went, as, as I grew up, I explored all kinds of things. I did theater. As a kid, I was a puppeteer. I was an apprentice puppeteer with a, um, with a professional company in Providence, Rhode Island. Started as an apprentice, went all the way through my college years, writing, um, building, and acting in puppet shows. And then, like in my senior, my junior, senior year of high school, I kind of got this acting bug thing. I went up on the stage a bunch with my school, did a couple of musicals, and thought, this is it. I'm going to do this. And I went to Emerson College in Boston for theater. And within three months, I thought, what am I doing here? These are not my people. This is not who I am. And I realized that I was denying myself my true love, which was acting through, through inanimate objects or through a pencil, right? So I was truly an animator at heart. And I never thought of an animator as being an actor, but they truly are an actor in every sense of the word. Um, so I decided um, at that point, three months in, probably in November, I applied to um, CalArts. And in 19, I think this was 1980. Um, so I started in 1981. Um, CalArts was the school that you went to for, for animation. If you wanted to work at Disney Animation, that was really one of, I think, two schools at the time that you could, that you could go to. Wow. 
and, and, and like traveling, traversing across country? Because you're, you're from Rhode Island, right? I am, yeah. So was that well, a That wasn't a problem. Okay, that, that was problem. fine. <laughs> Get out of there. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, you, you casually say that, you know, that you applied to CalArts, but what was that like? What was that portfolio and the meetings and all of that like briefly or as much as you'd want to elaborate? Because I'm just no. in awe of that. You just, I mean, it's casual. Well, you know, we went to CalArts. I'm like, like uh -huh. that's pretty uh -huh. impressive, so. You know, there, there were fewer of us going, applying to animation school at that time, right? So there weren't as many. I think, I think for some reason, I think my, my class was 30 kids. Now those classes are like over a hundred in most animation schools. Um, and um, I just I just took all the drawings I had, honestly. It worked. It worked. It worked. I just like piled them all. You had to take slides of them back then and send in slides. Um, there were no meetings. I, I, I didn't fly out to California first to go to check out the school to see if I was really gonna like it. That, that didn't exist. My family was very, very poor. Um, so, uh, so I just took a winger, right? And just applied and got in. I was lucky enough to be one of those guys. It worked. It was all good. Meant to be, as I like to say. So. Right, right. I think that's true. For sure. Um, so when we spoke back in 2017, I had asked you at that point, what's some advice that you could give to people that wanted to pursue animation or, or people particularly because you are coming from Rhode Island and Brenda came from Beeson, Illinois, you know, these smaller towns um, that uh, you don't necessarily associate with animation. And you said you, you had three pieces of advice. You said you got to ask for it. You've got to be lucky. And then you've got to deliver once you're given it. So can you talk to us a bit about how in your early career you used that philosophy to basically propel yourself to be able to get, you know, your first directing gig on Goofy Movie or whatever the case may be? I've asked for everything that I've ever gotten. I haven't gotten everything I've asked for, but I've asked for the things I've gotten. And I think it all started really back at the puppet workshop again, the, the troupe I worked with uh, in Rhode Island is that I was a welfare kid my city was giving jobs to, to welfare kids, kids for the summer. I went to the puppet workshop who I'd seen perform and I said, hey, I really wanna do this. They, they knew my, they knew I was a, a puppeteer, kid puppeteer. So they, um, so they, I, I, I worked it out so that I could actually get the city of Pawtucket to put together a job. I went to them and said, hey, if you'll hire me, they'll pay for it. And I made, a, I made an opportunity for myself. And I realized at that moment that that's what life was going to be for me. And nobody was gonna give me anything that I had to ask for it at every turn. So I asked to be a director after a little bit of time at, at Disney. I had done some, I had directed a couple of theater performances. Um, I had worked my way through many different jobs at the studio. And I went to them and I said, hey, I want to direct. Um, and they said, sorry, there's no room at the end. <laughs> so I left. I left to pursue directing. And then within a year, I was getting a, uh, you know, getting a call from Disney saying, hey, we never should have let you go. Do you want to direct a goofy movie? <laughs> so, you know, by asking, it happened. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you worked on, before getting that directing gig, you worked on so many great classic uh, films, things like Aladdin and Little Mermaid. I need to give you a, a shout out for Brave Little Toaster. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, that was like my, <laughs> that was my movie. I would just be like, you know, that, um, that scene with the air conditioner absolutely terrified me. Right. Uh, but everything about that film is so, so wonderful. I wish it was on Disney Plus for some reason. I, I don't know if it's licensing or what it is, but. It has to be, that would be the only reason, right? Is licensing. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, that was my very first job because when I graduated from CalArts, it was the very first year that no one was hired by the studio. Ooh. Zero. Ooh. Oh. We were shocked. We were absolutely shocked. We put sweat and blood into getting that. That's why you went to Cal Arts because you wanted to be a Disney animator. And uh, no one was hired. And I had to go find a job. 
And the job I found was on a brave little toaster. And I went to Taiwan. I was actually lived in Taiwan for seven months, I think, oh, animating wow. on the brave little toaster in 1985. I think. Yeah. Well, this kid that was born in 1986 really appreciated it. So, <laughs> so thank you for doing all that. Uh, but it was just such a, it's such a cool thing. And, and, you know, they have the sequels on Disney Plus. So again, it must be a licensing kind of a thing. Uh, but I would love to see. I actually have the DVD of it. Um, right, right. And, you know, now uh, we're going to go back in talking more about Goofy Movie. Another thing you mentioned was that you were hoping that uh, they would give a digital cut of a Goofy Movie uh, the last time we spoke. And um, I know it only, I think it only went out to the Disney Movie Club, but I have the Blu-ray now of a Goofy Movie. So that is there, which is wonderful. So cool. Well, after we met, I was actually called in to do a... Um, I don't think they had a 4K, they had a 2K scan mm -hmm. of it. And we, and we put together a, uh, they tried to tell me it was a 4K, but we figured out it was only a 2K. Um, and we, uh, you know, we did a whole new color timing. And um, unfortunately, we didn't restore the tracks. The tracks were the original tracks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so they, so they put a little bit of money into it, recognizing, I think because there had been so much so much talk about the movie online. They did a D23, do you know what that is? That's the, the big mm -hmm. fan club. They did a D23, um, like a talk. And you can see it online in which Tevin Campbell sings eye to eye at the very end of it. And um, they had to turn away, I think four to 500 people. That's great. That their theater was too small from what, for what they were expecting. And I think in that moment they said, oh, wait a minute, there's something here. People are really reacting to this. They hadn't paid any attention to it for years. It was neglected. It was one of the neglected Disney films. And so they, they spent a little bit of dough. Yeah. Uh, Brett actually, <laughs> Brett has been out at D23 the last two uh, D23s. Well, and so he's yes. been one of those guys sleeping on the concrete. He's sleeping on the floor, <laughs> waiting for it. Center. Yes. Gladly, actually. It's better, it's better to be in the space than outside waiting to get in, so. Did you, uh, did you happen to stick around for the Tarzan piece that we did? We did a Tarzan piece on the last day, this past uh, 2020. I didn't. Yeah. Had Shame I have known. On Shame on you. I know. <laughs> the last day. Well, the last day. Oh, was that at the was Sunday? Day? Same time. Was it at the same time as the parks? That no, I don't think so. It was the very last, the very last thing, thing okay. in the big hall on that last day. Yeah. Okay. Because I cool. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm positive if, if you're, if you're back in uh, 2021, you will be there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll that be was there. The first time I had ever been to D23. I what was did you think? What did you think? What did I, I mean, think of the overall experience? Well, I yeah. didn't have to wait in any line, <laughs> <laughs> so it was it's easy worth it. for me. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. No, I thought it was cool. I, I really enjoyed, there were a couple of things I really loved. One of the things was the, the costume exhibit they had this year. Oh, it was that really was amazing. Beautiful. See it all was those, those live action costumes. Yeah, it really nice. was gorgeous. Yeah. Well, you had seen some of those before, hadn't you? Yes, I had. <laughs> some of them were from my movies. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy. Oh, I just got chills for you. So I'm like, <laughs> what a great experience. Oh my gosh. That was the highlight. It was amazing. I think you'll probably appreciate this. Brett talks about going to D23 so often. We've established a, a quote unquote drinking game around that. My, uh, my contribution to the drinking game is I'll always mention the time I got to interview Brenda Chapman and Kevin Lima. <laughs> so, oh, really? Hello. You're so funny. Yeah, so it's <laughs> no one upping. Uh uh. No. no, no, no. It's All right. Good. Leave it alone. Leave uh -huh. it alone Greg. Um, but we'll go to Brett now uh, because he wants to talk to you about voice casting. Okay. I think it, it, it was an amazing voice cast. I mean, from top to bottom, but how does that process work? So you have Bill Farmer is Goofy and Jim Cummings is Pete, but it's kind of like, is it, we want a, a Sean Wallace type or a Polly Shore type, or do you, can you say, we want Sean Wallace and we want Polly Shore, you know? We can. <laughs> Yeah, I thought you so. Know, there, there, there are some roles we audition for, like for Max. I wanted an older Max. Mm -hmm. I wanted a high school age Max that sounded more male. Yeah. Because um, the cartoon show has one of those squeaky little voices. It kind of sounds like a little kid. Um, done by a girl. Um, 
So we, we, we auditioned for that. We auditioned for, for most of the roles, but a couple of them, the ones you mentioned, um, I went directly to Wallace Shawn and said, hey, I want you to, I, I'd love for you to do this. He said yes right away. We went to Pauly Shore when we were developing Bobby, just trying to figure out, okay, what kind of type? We want this kind of stoner type from when we were all in high school, only we're not gonna say that that's what he is. We're gonna use all these other, you know, these other ways of saying it. It was the cheese, the cheese it was with. about the cheese. Yes, yeah. it's all about that the cheese. That was a choice. That was, were there any other options besides cheese? But it makes a great sight gag, so, you know. We wrote it and storyboarded it as cheese. <laughs> he tried some other things and we liked our idea better. Um, <laughs> so, so it happens all different kinds of ways. That's so cool. Well, I mean, you had Julie Brown and Joanne Worley and Let's see. You actually know who these people are? Yeah, and Florence Stanley. Florence oh, Stanley, my yes. Gosh. <laughs> so good. I mean, you know, they're known for their voices, you know, for having amazing voices. So it was just so cool to listen to all that. Again. And I like and I like character voices more than I like cartoony voices. So I tend to like real life voices that sound caricatured mm -hmm. in a way. Like Pat Buttram. Pat Buttram's in the movie. Do you know Pat Buttram? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, so he was wow. the voice. He was one of the voices in Robin Hood. And yeah, he was in Robin Hood. Yeah, yeah. He I was think Sheriff of, yeah. Sheriff of Nottingham. Yeah, Sheriff of Nottingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he has a real distinct voice, and that's what I sort of look for: real life car cartoony voices and caricatured voices, yeah. especially for that movie. Right, that movie kind of yeah. demands it. Well, they're almost when you have that sort of voice, it's almost. Um, you know more about the character just from their body of work or their animated work or whatever. You kind of know their type, which is interesting. It's yeah. kind of a shortcut. So. And their voice also is a type, right? So Pauly Shore is a type, just the way yeah. he sounds. You know, smoke edge. Right away, you know exactly who that character is, right? So when you've got, especially secondary characters, it's important, I think, to really define them distinctly right away by their vocal quality. Including the possum, because you're our favorite possum, I, I believe. Didn't you, didn't you voice the, the... That was my question, okay. yes. I'm like going, how did you get, yeah. I'm like going, so, um, so Kevin Lima played um, Lester. So how was yeah. that experience and how easy was it to work with? And was he fun? Well, that, you know, <laughs> he's a bit of a diva. <laughs> That's you know, okay. His way, only his way. No, you know how that came about is that we do temp tracks for our movies, right? So when we're putting together the movie, we kind of edit our movie before we animate it. So we do still drawings in storyboard fashion, but then we cut on film and we do all the voices just to see if the movie is working before we go into the, the, the booth with an actor. So I was the voice of Goofy during all of those temp tracks. And I did Lester. And we hadn't cast the character yet, and we did a screening, and everybody laughed. And so is. the whole audience was busted up. So we said, all right, let's, we think <laughs> you should leave your voice in there. We think, and so that's how it, that's how it came to be. And he's a, he's a fan favorite, I'm so happy about it. <laughs> uh, I saw someone with a Lester's par a Possum Park t-shirt on the other day, and I was like, you got to be kidding. Oh, my gosh. Some <laughs> Etsy there. You have an Etsy yeah, opportunity yeah. there. So that yeah, so cool. that's me. Howdy, cool. folks. That's me. Aww. Love it. Love it. That's there was no... Your favorite Vanessa. possum. I seriously said Vanessa. that all the time as a child, but I'm from the <laughs> woods, so, you know. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, there you go. Great. Vanessa, you had a question. Yeah, well, actually, that, that is one of my favorite parts of the film. And I was just wondering, you know, what is your favorite part? Or is there anything in the film that you're, you're most proud of? My favorite scene in the movie may surprise you. And um, you brought, actually brought this up earlier, Craig, is the hot tub scene. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite yeah. scene in the movie. Just because we pulled off something with such such subtlety with those characters, right? I feel so bad for Goofy in that scene. Mm -hmm. And he's filled with, you know, 
and he, and, he, and he moves from complete confidence to utter self-doubt within that within that scene and i and i'm very very proud of having having shaped that scene um i don't know the, 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 you know it's hard it's hard to point out you know what you're most proud of in the movie because the movie itself brings me a certain amount of pride the whole thing does um I think what I what I'm most proud of is that we found a way to be that we found a universal sort of subject with the, with those characters, right? That you wouldn't expect it. We we subverted expectation. You expect one thing when you go into a goofy movie, and you get something totally different, which which I'm I'm pretty proud of. Absolutely, hopefully so. So we're gonna uh, leave the, the car and the perfect cast behind. We're, we're gonna go into Tarzan now a little bit. So um, talking Tarzan with me, I, I should tell you first off that Vanessa had a pretty large crush on a young Phil Collins. So like a 1999 Phil Collins during Tarzan, Strangers Like Me music video. <laughs> it was perfection. I'll make sure to tell him. Oh my god, don't, oh, oh my, my gosh. Oh, oh my gosh, she just made her <laughs> lifetime. Oh my gosh. Oh boy. So how did that production differ from a goofy movie? Obviously it had a much larger budget. It was uh so is that a, a blessing or is that a curse that you're moving from? Because Goofy was made as a, a kind of in the television side of things. This was full-blown yeah. feature, um, and I know you had a co-director along with you, but right. can you tell us the difference between uh, the two productions? Well, I think the biggest, the biggest difference would be that one was a, a worldwide production. In fact, we did a goofy movie, we did pre-production, storyboards, story reels, casting, recordings in Los Angeles. We animated it in France, in Paris, France. I went to Paris for a year. We had studios in Australia. The Australian studio did, Disney Australia did um, the eye to eye concert at the end. Cleanup was, some cleanup was done in Toronto and we had some animation done in Spain. So it was a worldwide endeavor. Tarzan all took place in one building. Wow. Stooped to nuts. So that was the biggest, the biggest change. I got to sleep in my bed every night while I was making Tarzan. Although I'd say living in France for Paris, France for a year, it's not a bad thing <laughs> um, either. So, um, so that was the biggest thing. And that mostly has to do with budget, right? So we spent 19 million on a goofy movie. And I want to say it was about 160 on Tarzan. Makes a big difference, yeah. big, big difference. Well, you get to stay at home. <laughs> you get to stay at home, Less but, per also, diem? I don't but know. <laughs> also you have the best, you have the best animators in the world. Glenn Keane. Yes, Glenn oh Keane, gosh. all working in one place. Um, interesting enough though, Glenn was living in France, in Paris. Oh. And so we convinced Glenn to take one of our characters, Tarzan, and do it totally in Paris. We said, we'd love for you to lead this character and he said, but I don't want to leave Paris. And we said, okay, the Paris studio will only do Tarzan. Wow. So he stayed and took that character over. But I got to stay in Los Angeles. And we had video conferencing, so I could actually like talk to, the, talk to them and the animators. Um, and they used to make fun of me too, because I, I used to climb up on the table acting like Tarzan, right? And acting things out for them. And there's Glenn Keane like pressing the record button <laughs> on its side, and then sending me little, uh, little uh, screen grabs. Um, so, so that was the biggest, the biggest difference. Um, I, at, at Disney Features, they wouldn't uh, allow me to be a sing, uh, so, uh, you know, a solitary director, a single director. So, because all their movies were made with two directors. Um, I've never been quite sure why, but, uh, but that was the way they had done it. So I called uh, one of my very, very close friends who I knew I shared a real sensibility with, uh, Chris Buck. And we had actually worked, while I was a senior in college, I worked for him as an animator on something called Goofy in Soccer Mania. It's a, that, that's, a, that's a hidden gem. Nobody talks about that, about that little piece. So I was, I was an animator under him. He was my supervising animator. And we become friends. And 
I knew that we shared a lot, you know, a sensibility. So I asked him if he'd, uh, if he'd want to do it, if he'd want to make the movie, direct a movie with me. Wow. So, we, made, we were a really good pair. We, 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 we worked together really, really well. Yeah, it's just it's such a great film. And you're a musical theater kid at heart. So tell me about how amazing it is when uh, Disney uh, turns it into a Broadway show. It was amazing and then utterly disappointing. Um, <laughs> so I was so thrilled that they were doing it and that Phil was involved. And um, unfortunately, they, don't, they didn't involve the directors. Mm as they move forward, because they don't want to hear what we have to say, you know, they're going to make it better. Um, and when I saw it, I was very disappointed. I was mm -hmm. very, very disappointed in it. Um, so it was thrilling, but at the same time, I wish it had been a huge, a huge hit. Um, and it been a better show. Well, it, yeah. it's a very high concept and the staging is difficult. You know, it, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't um, Spider Man Into the Night difficult, but you know, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but yeah, yeah, it was a difficult show. But but surprisingly, I think they retooled it, and it played for ten years in Germany. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, so it had a long life in Germany, and oh, they cool. totally retooled the show, um, which I, I fortunately I didn't get to see. I've only ever seen little snippets of it, but uh, but. I know amazing. that they also have a, a junior version because our uh, Vanessa actually is the uh, assistant director at our local arts center and they just put it on what a couple of years ago right Vanessa? Um, I would say within the last five years. Yeah, yeah. And, how, and, how, and what did you think of it in that version? Um, it, 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 it's different. <laughs> you know, I saw it at the, we have the St. Louis Muni Opera, and yeah. it was very grand, Tarzan flies, and, and I believe we did have flying um, in our production, but, and it's kids, so it, I mean, it was very cute, but it kind of does lost it, some of the grandiose. Does it, does it hue closer to the animated film? I would guess that it probably takes out some of the added things and Oh, you know, it's been so long. I couldn't, yeah, okay. I couldn't point to specifics. Uh, right. I remember a lot of kids liked it and we sold out houses. So, you know, at least we yeah. got our money out of it. Good, 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 good. Do you want to ask him a question about Phil, uh, Vanessa? You know, you know, I do not because I'm so <laughs> embarrassed. Come on, ask me a question. <laughs> I, you know, my mom and I are mu music people and we're just, that is one of the reasons we went to go see Tarzan because we knew he was on the project. And then, and then I think there was some like, um, like maybe behind the scenes footage of, of you all discussing how like skateboarding was going to play into the animation. And I remember just thinking it was so cool. And then you, you hear trash in the camp and you hear the, the intro, um, to uh, one of the musical numbers, which is just like these drums. And it was just yeah. so awesome. I just remember thinking, gosh, that must have just been so fun to work with Phil Collins on this, on this movie. Well, you bring, up, you bring up drums, and that's exactly why we asked him to do it. Because we wanted to create a voice that was different than The Lion King. How do you create an African voice that isn't sort of the vocal, you know, the, the vocal treatment that The Lion King got? And we, we pecked around looking for pop artists first and foremost, because we felt like we didn't want this. I couldn't imagine Tarzan, a naked man standing on a branch breaking in the song in the movie. Yeah. I just couldn't imagine. I thought that people are just going to laugh at that. So we were thinking about, let's make the songs the internal monologue for the character. Let's have it, the songs express what's going on inside on a subconscious level. And um, finally came down to, you know, like three or four people and we listened to in the air tonight and said that's the guy has to be that guy yeah. and um it was it was a remarkable collaboration because he got it right away he was trepidatious to begin with he was like i don't know if i can write this kind of stuff i'm not a broadway writer and we went we actually went and visited him in geneva to convince him to do it and uh he was kind of like i don't know about this we said no this is exactly what we want from you we want you to bring a different sensibility. We want the music to hit a different chord in this movie. Um, so he came on board and I'll tell you within the first, I don't know, the, after the first meeting, he came back with, you'll be in my heart and was like banging it out on the, on the railing. 
and wow. you know, came back a couple of a couple of days later with a whole set of lyrics, which I heard later he had written out on a napkin when they came to him. But you know, we we worked really well together. We we planned out where we wanted the songs to be. I'm a I'm you know I'm a big musical theater fan, and I had written a couple of musicals that never got produced. And I thought, you know, hey, Hoagland. <laughs> yeah. We I might know. have, we can maybe get that done, you know? Uh, <laughs> we know people. <laughs> I don't know if the world needs to see them. Um, <laughs> and I, um, and so I was really, really involved. I plotted out where the song should be. I gave him titles in some places. Not that he had to use them, but that's how I, that's how I work. I sort of plan the whole thing out as one big fabric. So, and it was wonderful. It was wonderful. We're friends to this day. Stop! You're friends with Bill Cullen? <laughs> Stop it! Oh I, my think gosh. I, I think I just beat you, Craig. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think you did. I think you did. You said, I'm friends with Kevin and Brenda. I said, I'm friends with Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think your list is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 speaking of that list, uh, a good transition point for moving into, I know Brett wants to talk about Enchanted, but Alan Macon and Stephen Schwartz. I mean, that's some other, that's, those, those names are royalty amongst us theater crowd. And um, how was it uh, working with them uh, to develop? I actually found it was online uh, because Enchanted is not on Disney Plus at the moment, which is a It is not, I don't um, know. But- uh, My guess is that Enchanted still has a, has a outstanding deal with Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I did find a featurette uh, online. It was like a 17 minute making of, and it was uh, really you talking about the, the process of going and uh, working with, with Alan Mank and then with Stephen Schwartz and, and coming up with the music. And they've got that you, you know, they're showing you uh, filming in Central Park. It's really beautiful. Uh, we can definitely uh, get people that if they want to to check it out. But um, talk to me about the process of working on the music for that. And then also, uh, you had directed 102 Dalmatians, but this was another uh, live action. This was kind of a combination live action animation type film. So talk to us a bit about that process too. I think the wonderful thing about Enchanted for me is it allowed me to bring both of my loves together, right? So I got to make a hybrid movie that involved animation and is about animation. In a in the live action context, so so that was the cool thing about that. Working with Alan and, and Stephen was also a dream for me because I am also a big fan and I'd seen all of their work and had worked on so many of the films that they had made, uh, you know, that they had um, written the scores or the songs for, and scores. Um, so when we started talking about Enchanted and what kind of movie it was going to be and it being a love letter to Disney animation it felt like, well, we should go to the guys who are at the top of their game when it comes to, you know, you know, paying homage to, to Disney movies. And it was fun and it was easy um, because we all shared a similar language, both in Disney songs and in the Broadway um, pieces, um, Broadway shows. So, so it, was, it, was, it was great fun. It wasn't without its hard work, it was hard. But it, was, but it was fun. I think Alan talks about the opening number a bunch, how it took us, I think we wrote three songs to get to that opening number. Um, and we knew what our model was, you know, someday my prince will come, um, right? Uh, so, so we kept, you know, so we kept, how do we pay homage to it while writing a song that feels totally like our own? Yeah, absolutely, Brett. Yeah, well, Enchanted is one of my favorite films. I must say, when I when I went, I was really looking forward to it because it's Disney and live action and everything that it became. But when you're waiting to watch it, I'm like going, I was a little anxious, I guess, because I'm like yeah. going, okay, um, how Most far people they gonna, think we're how far out. will they go? Yes, sacrilegious. I'm like going, right, right. I'm like we're going, selling out. Is this going to be Shrek? Wait a minute. And then no, within within. Uh, by the time the animated first part was not even finished, I'm like going, they've got this. They, it's just hits the right notes. Oop, residual goosebumps. Uh, it hits the, the right notes. And, 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 and I knew that it was, I knew that we would be taken care of and it would be everything that it turned out to be, which was 
amazing. Okay, I've loved, I've loved all your work. Okay, this is my point. This, I love, I love Enchanted. Um, Eloise, I loved Eloise. You know, <laughs> I'm like going an adult guy that's liking Eloise because it's, you know, it's like it's it's Julie Andrews and perfection yeah. and the Plaza yeah. Hotel. Who knows? Anyway, and anyway, so we've all talked about that. But I was anxious, and then I had a heavy sigh after the the opening. So. Anyway, right. thank you and congratulations. But, uh, but, but what was so you, cool is that Amy Adams just captured her own Disney princess. And there was so much detail. And so what was that like? I mean, actually, there was the part where she had me is when she had her hands. Because she had Disney hands. Okay. I worked at Walt Disney World in entertainment. And so I am friends with a number of Disney princesses, shall we say. And... Yeah. You know, so I was looking when she had her hands with her just this this perfect princess hand pose that was hers and just hers. So what was that like? And was it a combination of her process and your direction or? Yeah, it was. Credit for because she's not here unless you'd like to bring her aboard. <laughs> I know her too. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh! See, I'm having a Phil Collins, Amy Adams moment. I'm like, oh my gosh! It was really a collaboration between the two of us. She, we 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 searched for for someone to play Giselle. Big old search. In the studio, wanted me to hire someone who was well known. So they wanted an actress who could sell the movie. And I was fighting them. I said, no, no, no. This is like Julie Andrews in, the, in Mary Poppins. This is going to be this, this actress's introduction to the world. And I want the world to believe that Giselle is real, that they're not watching somebody they know playing a role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Amy walked into the room um, in a, for an audition. I had a fever at the time, so I was not feeling good. Oh. And she made me forget that I was sick. I was so happy. Oh. I just forgot that I was sick. And a 15 minute audition turned into 45 minutes. And I knew in that moment that I had found, um, found Giselle. And the whole thing about the physicalization of the piece started in that audition. So she read the scene, we talked about it. We talked about getting up, we got up on our feet we physicalized. What does it mean to be a Disney princess? And I did this to her, pink knees up, and then she did that. And yep. that's where it all started. And if you watch, and if you watch the movie, you'll notice that as her character grows, her physical stance changes mm -hmm. dramatically. Mm -hmm. And that went, and that came, and that was all planned. Amy and I talked about it over a couple of dinners. And she plotted out how that was going to work depending upon what scene she was in. Excellent. We supported that with costumes and hair. So her, if you watch the costumes change mm -hmm. completely to the end of the piece, she's, she's still herself. She doesn't give up who she is mm -hmm. as a person internally, but she's become human. Right, well, it's, the, it's to say she was a two-dimensional character, but that's not a two-dimensional character. She just has more life experience as a, you know, in the, the real world. In the real and, world, and the, right? And, um, and yes. it moves so gently, but so deliberately, apparently. That the songs it, even it, do the same thing. If you, so you listen good. to the songs, right? They move from yeah. the songs that she sings that come out of her mouth to a song that's played on a band to songs that are in the voiceover track of the movie. So, so it's all planned to be the transition from animation break into song to real needle drop okay. work. so tears ah oh my gosh i love it. i love that film but you know in, in amy's hands in in the hands of an absolute genius really she is a, a, an unbelievably talented woman where's her oscar it's about time i so. know i know <laughs> i know so there you go this is great so that was yeah that was great Vanessa, you have a question about kind of what you're what you're up to now, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, you know, I, I went back and listened to your interview that uh, you and Craig did together and, and Brenda was joining in there. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, I see that you have Twas Entertainment now. Um, yeah. What what are you guys working on together? What's it like working together? 
it all it all started. We decided to work together, you know, after after years of having parallel parallel careers. Um, and we thought, what are we doing? We're both really talented. We love being together. Let's see if we can make this work. I think we were afraid that maybe it would it would cause some sort of problems um, because you know two directors, two egos in the room. Um, but we started after I was developing a movie, and Brenda was too at DreamWorks Animation, and they decided to sell that company, and all of our movies just went away. They all got absorbed after, you know, they spent tens of millions of dollars on my movie. And I was working with Steven Schwartz and A.R. Rahman, who is the, the big Bollywood composer. And so Brenda and I looked at each other and said, how do we gain more control over our work? So we decided to write together to begin with. So we wrote a script together. And while that was happening, we were asked by Fox if we wanted to form a production company and get a uh, first look deal at the studio. So we've been, we're in our third year, just starting in May, we'll start our third year of that contract. And um, we're developing movies and selling movies. So they they took on our our um, our first uh, the movie that we wrote, um, which is a I can tell you about it because it's been in the press. It's called the Cartoon Touch, and if you know the story of the Midas Touch, which is everything he touched, the King oh, Touch no. turns to gold. Oh. Yeah, look, he's thinking about it already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our hero is cursed with everything he touches turns into a cartoon. <laughs> yeah. And his whole world, all of New York, the uh, the island of Manhattan, turns into a cartoon. And much like what's going on today, they're going to blow up the bridges to contain the cartoon virus. Oh, wow. Right? So it doesn't spread throughout the entire world. Um, and this character goes on a journey of learning what it is to, to deal with, uh, you know, he's, he's the kind of guy who hides from relationships. And he, he, he loves animation. And he sort of hides behind the armor of loving animation. And he's, he's forced to deal with his, you know, who he is. And it's a, it's a story that contains, I don't think this has been done before, that has CG, 2D, puppets, clay, oil oh. painting, all kinds of oh, animation wow. combined in one movie. Oh, wow. So that's, so that's one thing that, that's, that's the top of my, like, I have to get this movie made. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, would be a, that would be a dream project for me. And to work with all of those animators who, from all different disciplines within our, you know, within the animation business um, would be, would be a thrill. Um, and then we've got a couple of other things. We're just, uh, we just sold something to Netflix, a six, I can't tell you what it is, but it's a six okay. episode okay. limited series, um, cool. which is cool. And I'm writing that with, uh, with Bill Kelly, who wrote Enchanted. Awesome. Okay. So there's that, and there's a Disney awesome. Plus movie, and not a Disney Plus, but a Disney Channel movie, and then there's a bunch of other things that we're in the process of, of working on. We got about we got about ten movies in development right now. Did you hear that, Brett? You can't cancel Netflix yet. Okay. I, well, actually, I got it back. I got it back. <laughs> I'm like going when all this happened. I'm like going. I need entertainment options. So. <laughs> so. Right. You had a question about all that, right? Yeah, I did. Um, Let's see. Well, given our current circumstances, are the streaming platforms um, opportunities for more animation content? And then, and Disney Plus brought to you new audiences. Again, is the um, answer. <laughs> yeah, across the wow. across the board. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, it's very hard to get a studio to to dedicate hundreds of millions of dollars to making a movie. Right between making the movie and marketing a movie, that's a lot of money. Um, so that's why you see, you know, the big tentpole Marvel movies as being what you get in movie theaters now. And uh, honestly, audiences aren't heading to the movie theaters to watch certain types of content anymore. They're watching it all at home. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make a drama or a mid a mid budget movie, you're going to see it on on a streaming channel. Now Disney, if you look at Disney Plus, they're taking a lot of their big titles and they're doing them for Disney Plus, right? So you look at Lady and the Tramp. That was originally a theatrical release that they decided to put out on Disney Plus. Um, my guess is probably they look at a movie and decide, do we want to spend $50 million supporting this movie with marketing? 
and then they, they make already a decision, have an audience right with, they, right. with, with so many subscribers right we spent but, 50 million dollars on it to begin with i don't know if that's what they spent but we spent 50 million dollars on this movie it's going to cost us another 50. do we want to do we want to do that or can we use you know can we release that movie on our streaming platform which brings in eyeballs well, that was actually yesterday. I want to make sure this quote is correct, but um, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences announced Tuesday that due to the coronavirus pandemic, streaming only films will be eligible for the Academy Awards for the first time and only for one year. Do you think that this is a change to the industry that's a little, a lot, or here forever? I think it's temporary. I think it's temporary. I think it's because of the Academy is very yeah, specific. and there are only and, and 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 there's more limitations than what you just read. There are limitations that oh. have to do with it was a movie that was supposed to be mm. put ah. in movie theaters, mm -hmm. right? Mm. So and didn't get that opportunity. So they will consider that movie if it was planned to go into theaters. So every movie that shows up on Netflix is not going to be available. It's not going to be eligible for as much as they'd like that to happen. They'd love that to happen. <laughs> Um, I think they should just start their own. I think there should be some streaming awards that happen, right? There should be some, you know? Yeah, you know? I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, Kevin, we want to just say thank you so much for your time. And I know you do a lot of these interviews and we're so grateful for that. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, what's something that you never get to talk about? Something that you always want to talk about, you're hoping someone asks you about it and you just, you just don't get a, a chance to, to mention it. Is there something that comes to mind? If not, that's totally fine. I don't know, I kind of live in the moment. I love, I love being surprised by a question that I haven't been asked before. And I think you can tell because I've got a, you know, I've got a couple of stories. So ask a <laughs> question that sort of comes from, comes from a place of something that's personal. I, I especially like talking about how my, my life has, has influenced what I do. Um, so, so and I think there's, there's a truth to my movies because of that. Um, so. That's your through line. It certainly is. And quality, is. may I just say. Humbly, I say to you, quality. So thank you. Thank I love you. it all. So you know the other the other thing that that I like to talk about is perseverance, because I'll tell you, it's not easy to have a career in the arts, especially a in a career in film. And I spent the last I think it's thirteen years now trying to make a movie. And I get up every day, and I'm still I still have that drive to to tell stories to tell you know, interesting stories with dynamic characters. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to leave. You know, I'm going to, you know, when Hollywood doesn't want me anymore, I'm going to go to my garage and start building puppets again. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> become that old man who's a puppeteer. Hello, or, you know, that guy. Because I don't think I'll, I'll know how to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Artists don't stop. It takes stop. perseverance. Artists it does take don't perseverance. Stop, so, yeah. no. Yeah, you're right. Well, to kind of wrap it all in a bow, uh, the last question we had, maybe maybe not so seriously from the Facebook page, was uh, when is Tevin Campbell going to release the full Powerline album? When is that going to come? Uh, you've got you've to gotta let him know. <laughs> I, I wish it would happen. I, I tried to make it happen way back when the movie came out. I said, you know, that we should do a Powerline album. It just makes sense. Um, and... Uh, you know, they didn't engage then, I think maybe because the movie didn't make enough money in its re original release. Um, and I'd love for them to do it now. Although I did notice that if you're on Apple Music, you can't get eye to eye or stand out. Right, yeah. On the streaming platform, um, music streaming. So I was wondering about that. I wonder if something's going on with Tevin or with the original songwriters. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that too on Spotify. Um, you also Spotify, can't, you can't get it either. My son is like obsessed with it on, um, and so I tried to stream it in whatever way possible and you can't get those songs. So you have to go and buy the album. Uh, if you buy the full album off of like an Apple or an Amazon, then you get access to those songs. So. Right, right. Well, the other thing you do is you watch it on YouTube. Right, absolutely. <laughs> That's the way you get it. Absolutely. So. If people want to follow you, Kevin, uh, I know you just uh, recently joined Twitter for this whole 25th anniversary thing. I Is did, that the best I place to, to check you out? Yeah, yeah, I think it's the best place now. I, I, I joined Twitter. I joined in 2011, but the first time I actually tweeted was uh, 
it was a couple of Fridays ago. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so for, for the big watch party uh d23 watch party um yeah and that's that's been that's actually been good fun i get to hear from a lot of people so that would be the best place so i'm uh i'm at goofy movie dir d-i-r that's perfect that's perfect well thank you again uh we just so appreciate you coming on uh being a returning guest on the podcast it just means a lot to us and all of us Disney fans. And thank you for the uh, incredible amount of work that you and Brenda have done uh, to just build up these worlds that allow us to not only escape for a little while, but also uh, allow us to still understand that there's some real world implications and almost teach kids in a way uh, some of these things like uh, relationships between your parents or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and show them that they're going to come out on the other side of this. It's going to be okay. That's that's what Disney does. I think better than any uh, other animation studio is, is, and Pixar for sure um, is focusing on those emotions. And so, thank you so much for everything that well, you. Craig, I can't wait to talk to you about a goofy movie when your son is fifteen. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We'll book it now for sure. So, you know, um, this is so great. Thank you. Right. You're, you're very, very welcome. It was good talking to you all. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Alrighty, you're welcome. Tell so, Phil everyone. I said hi. Hey. It's great talking to you. Oh, I, I don't want to disconnect you ever. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'll let you go. Bye now. Whoa, that was. Oh, my gosh. So uh, glad I didn't throw up. You so know, so excited. <laughs> <laughs> it just it just speaks to um, his ability to tell those stories in such a way that are is just so compelling. You can tell why he's such a good artist and able to bring that to the screen for us all to enjoy. So thank you again to Kevin Lima. We we just had a, a great hour with you. It was so wonderful, Brett Vanessa. What are your wrap up thoughts here? We'll go with Brett first. I'm still, I have residual goosebumps from the residual goosebumps that was, that, that was all part of the interview. I'm just like going, it's amazing. Ah. Yeah, it is, it is so inspiring to listen to someone with that much talent to talk about um, the way they think about things and the, the way they direct. And it, it, he was just absolutely wonderful. It was so great to talk to him. And he's going to tell Phil Collins that I said hello. <laughs> One degree of separation, <laughs> baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's just uh, uh, wonderful to talk not only about Goofy Movie, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary, which, by the way, it's on Disney Plus, so you can watch it right after you're done with this. And I would encourage you to do so. It is such a good film. It uh, it's incredible. Uh, and you know, because it was made for TV. Uh, it started in the TV division, then was produced on uh, theatrically as well, but it didn't get some of the marketing, it didn't get some of the push. So if you're someone that's never seen a Goofy movie somehow, you didn't necessarily grow up in the 90s, I would encourage you to go and seek this film out because it is so good. But also Enchanted, um, what yeah, happened the nominations? We didn't even get into this, but uh, we didn't get into this, but the person that asked him to direct 102 Dalmatians was Glenn Close. Yeah. Glenn yeah. Close. Close. Hey, we, we didn't mention that because we had talked about that in a previous interview, which by the way, we're going to go ahead and link our previous interview with uh, Brenda Chapman and Kevin Lima as well uh, in the kind of the, the story notes for this, this episode. So you can go check that out too. But just incredible the career that this man has had and incredible the him wanting and being willing to sit down with us for an hour of this time. Just again, uh, we can't say thank you enough. Um, Vanessa, Brett, any other words? Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. And so we are going to return. Uh, so our next episode, we will be talking all things Disneyland. And these guys are going to try to convince me why I should go to Disneyland as opposed to Walt Disney World. They are crazy, right? But we'll see. We will see how that goes. Make sure to follow us on Facebook because we will be posting some more videos uh, there first and then going on to the audio feed. 
Uh, also, we do go live every now and then. So make sure you check us out there and we'd be happy if you can follow us along at Beyond the Mouse podcast. You can also find us on nprillinois.org or wherever you find your podcast. Just subscribe to Beyond the Mouse. We are so excited. Again, uh, just what a great day made for a, a great great day so thank you again and we can't say it enough thank you thank you thank you uh but for beyond the mouse i am craig i'm vanessa and i'm brett and we will see you real soon in the front row watching a goofy movie or maybe enchanted who knows but we'll see you soon oh my god <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was a that was a stellar interview. Good job, guys. I hope I hope my audience. My face that. hurts from smiling. I know. I was starting to twist. I do this. <laughs> All right, and then let's do an outro. Uh, oh my gosh, we're doing an outro. It's like we work for you know we do NPR things. <laughs> That's right. Oh, so, we do that. I'm gonna need some water. <laughs> I have a little bit of water left. I need my Mountain Dew. I was doing the high class water thing. Cause nice. I, you know, I like that he, he called out your background right away too. Yes. Well, did you see his? Like yeah. with the Janin poster? I'm like, I saw it! That one oh, my <laughs> oh my God! Were you able to get it? <laughs> <laughs>